Okay, well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this morning webinar, this morning's webinar, entitled uh, Women in Digital Southeast Asia, uh, Challenges and Opportunities. Uh, my name is Gilang Kembara. Uh, I'm from the Department of International Relations here at CSIS, and I'm delighted to be your moderator for this uh, two-hour webinar. Uh, a very quick disclaimer, I do have to apologize because I live so close to a train station, so once in a while you will hear a very strong uh, vibration from uh, trains coming by, so I do apologize for that disruption. Uh, disclaimer aside, I, I'm very glad here to wish to introduce the speakers and also the topic of uh, this morning's webinar. And uh, I do understand that throughout history, um, men has always been more noticeable than women in a various position, profession, fields, and expertise. Um, yet fortunately, we understand that the situation continues to improve uh, upon women's role and their inclusion into various fields that are more pertinent. Yet we find that women still face issues specifically within the cyberspace, um, such challenges, for example, challenges such as criminal organization, terrorist networks, and other uh, various interest groups are uh, trying to uh, uh, exploit the uh, certain loopholes uh, upon uh, women, for example, trafficking them or recruiting them into, uh, into terrorist groups or any other uh, organizations that have uh, some certain vested interests within this area. Now, joining me this morning, we have three speakers. Uh, I'd like to introduce the two that are currently here already. Uh, the first one I'd like to introduce Dr. Fitriani. Dr. Fitriani is a researcher at the International Relations Department for CSIS Indonesia. Uh, the second speaker today would be Farlina Said. Uh, she's an analyst, a colleague of mine from the Foreign Policy of the Foreign Policy and Security Studies Program at ISIS Malaysia. Good morning to you all. Uh, it's good to see you again. And the third speaker we have, we will have Ambassador Deidre Kelly, uh, the Canadian ambassador to the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. And I believe this is the third time uh, Ambassador Kelly would be presented uh, within uh, our webinar, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, since Ambassador Kelly is not here, I think we can start by having uh, Fitri, Dr. Fitriani, to speak first, and then on the other speaking, we'll have Fitri, and then secondly, followed by Pralina. Oh, I think Ambassador Kelly has tuned in. <laughs> Good morning, Ambassador Kelly. We just began. I just introduced all the speakers, including you. I hope you don't mind. Not a problem. In fact, I was on the line. It's just the, the video was not enabled, so I heard everything. Looking forward to joining the conversation. Brilliant. Uh, may I ask if, uh, well, I have in my list here that you are the first one to speak. So I don't know if uh, I'd just like to have the consent of all the speakers here if you, if I want to follow up with the list. Otherwise, uh, I can go ahead with Fitri, Farlina, and I'll have you at the last. Um, but please, I, I just need the, I just want to, to see whether you, you're okay to having, to be the first one speaking or the last one. I'm good to go. So we can stick with the original speaking order, no problem. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Ambassador. So I think we'll go ahead with the original uh, speaking list. So may I have Ambassador Deidre Kelly? Uh, you have the time and also the floor. I think we can have about 10 minutes or 12 minutes maximum for each uh, speaker to present because uh, we want to have a rich and enlightening discussion at the end of the of session. Please, Ambassador. Great. Thank you very much and good morning, everybody. It is wonderful to be virtually seeing you once again. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank CSIS for organizing this series of webinars with the Mission of Canada to ASEAN. We have been able to explore what I think are some of the most relevant and, and pressing issues that are facing the region uh, at the moment. Uh, and I'm really pleased that we were able to gather the caliber of experts that we have and that there has been such a high degree of interest. So again, thank you very much for convening these webinars uh, in cooperation with the, the, with the mission. Um, as I said, they've been very thought provoking 
Uh, and I really do hope that they will feed into further policy discussions, whether they be back in Canada or in the ASEAN region. Today is the finale uh, of this particular series of, of three discussions, and it is reflective of our new reality, uh, and that is the issue of women's issues in cyberspace. Uh, and there are certainly a range of issues that can be explored uh, in that context. It's going to be very interesting to hear from our esteemed speakers uh, and who are going to be able to provide um, really interesting perspectives according to their areas of expertise. So in that regard, what I would like to do is just make some brief remarks uh, in terms of some of the issues, uh, you know, more generally speaking, that are facing women in cyberspace. If I take a moment for reflection, we are now one year into the pandemic, and it's been one year uh, that I have been working from home. You can see behind me in my living room. I would guess uh, sometime during this session, you'll see my husband walking behind, my son walking behind, because my son's also undertaking virtual studies. Uh, but it, it hasn't only been a, a big shift for me. What it means is all around the region, people are working and socially interacting via the cyber world uh, as we stay home to protect ourselves, our loved ones, our friends, and our colleagues. Uh, and under this context, Canada has realized and has been emphasizing the importance of advocating for an open, free, and secure internet uh, where people can exchange views openly uh, and safely uh, and not be subject to repercussion because their, their views may not reflect uh, those of, of someone else. The internet and the cyberspace has become crucial for the economy, uh, as I said, for our socializing and social activities, for democracy. If you look at um, the situation in, in Myanmar, the, the internet has certainly proven to be an important space for for messaging um, and for sharing a certain perspective uh, of the nationals that live in that country and for national security as well. It's indispensable to people around the world. Uh, and shifts that we have all experienced since last year due to the pandemic have certainly made this more evident than ever. Cyber systems underpin the delivery of all aspects of life, uh, depending on uh, level of development and infrastructure. And that includes healthcare delivery, financial transactions, transportation, emergency communications amongst some, all of these things are critical around the world. The global pandemic has sped up the ongoing process of societal digitalization. And while these are positive developments, unfortunately, experiences have shown that gender-based uh, discrimination uh, and the experience of, of women uh, and other marginalized groups are, are different and they can experience discrimination and forms of, of harassment online. Uh, examples could include inviting a female colleague uh, to join a virtual meeting, but then only allowing her to participate in a listening mode while male colleagues uh, are taking credit for the work or actively contributing to the, the conversation. Uh, even worse, as we continue to stay at home, data tells us that for every three months of lockdown, there will likely be an additional 50 15 million cases of gender-based assaults. Female activists, journalists, and at-risk communities are facing digital threats and attacks. And then that's not it. And in parts of the world, there are increased usage of these cyber tools to entice women and girls to be recruited and join terrorist activities or to be exploited uh, by criminal networks in terms of, of human trafficking. So the, the experiences are different, um, the threats are real, 
uh, in addition to the positive developments uh, and enabling tools that have been presented in the cyberspace. And for all of these reasons, that is why Canada's national cyber security strategy puts forward the importance of international cooperation in carrying out norms of responsible state behavior in cyberspace. In particular, uh, in my context, under the framework of Canada ASEAN Partnership and our newly implemented five-year plan of action, we have made transnational crime and cybersecurity as one of our priorities. And every year when our ministers get together, uh, last year, uh, for example, in September, when the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Canada met uh, with his counterparts from around the region, we announced that there would be new funding totaling $9 million uh, focused on regional priorities, including cybersecurity. And uh, this is also an issue that is discussed in the ASEAN Regional Forum, which is a, a broader grouping uh, that includes some additional players in the region to talk about key geostrategic uh, developments. And so what do these plans of action and dialogue mean, you know, in concrete terms in, in cybersecurity? Well, in terms of the activities, the focus is on timely sharing of relevant information amongst law enforcement agencies, also the improvement for, of appropriate laws and capabilities to address cyber crimes, uh, including issues such as child online protection, strengthening the capacity of criminal justice authorities through training and the exchange of best practices to apply the laws of cyber crimes and electronic evidence with due consideration to respective domestic rules and legislations. Building a trusted digital ecosystem, including further strengthening of cooperation on cybersecurity, such as mitigating the risks from malicious software, malware, and developing measures to protect personal data. Uh, the protection of personal data, in fact, in Canada is a legislative requirement under uh, the Privacy Act in Canada, and there are some very stringent requirements in that regard. And then finally, exploring cooperation to build resilience to cyber threats through exchange of best practices, technical guidance, and various capacity building programs. And I'm happy to report that in terms of these concrete measures, we have, um, they are going to be complemented by a new project that we're undertaking with UN Women and ASEAN that focuses on women, peace and security. So we're really looking at making this as one of the, the key priorities in all of the initiatives that we are undertaking, just given the relevance of these issues and how widespread and far reaching uh, the impact of each of these topics is. So as the COVID-19 uh, pandemic continues, because it, we're certainly not at, at the end, I think you know, we're all unfortunately recognizing that there's still quite uh, a ways to go, uh, that the, you know, there's a need to challenge the traditional definitions of insecurity and instability, uh, especially for women and girls. Uh, and that's what we are attempting to do by taking a feminist approach to security, including through cybersecurity, uh, and realizing that by doing so, it's not simply virtue signaling, but these are, are real issues that require real solutions uh, and new lenses to be applied. It is a smart, practical solution, in our view, that hard security needs recognize the value of including women and girls uh, in conflict prevention and recognizing that direct benefits for women, girls, and, and other groups who are, whether they be survivors of abuse um, or other crimes, that they have the ability to use their experiences to, to shape the services that are provided by law enforcement, the way that cases are, are treated, and the way that tools are, are developed and, and have an important role to play in this dialogue. So because of those reasons, we are going to continue to work with ASEAN member states, with uh, the ASEAN Secretariat, with 
civil society and grassroots organizations in order to work towards identifying uh, solutions. Um, and then again, promoting friendly conduct uh, of relations uh, among states in, in cyberspace, because there's certainly risks uh, that exist there. And we're seeing increases of, of nefarious use of the, of the cyberspace by state actors. So there's a lot of work to do. Um, as I said at the beginning, the positive gains that have been brought forward by this hyper digitalization also present challenges. Uh, but despite the amount of work that we have to do, I'm, I'm hopeful that by including more voices, more views, more experiences into the, the dialogue that we will ultimately be able to produce better tools, policy and legislation in order to, to deal with the challenges and the new realities that we face. So thank you very much again for inviting me. Um, and that concludes my opening remarks. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador Kelly, right on time. And I thank you for framing the focus and also the issue uh, very eloquently and very succinctly. Uh, I think uh, you've done very well to uh, provide us with the understanding of Canada's focus within the issue of cyberspace and how it affects marginalized groups and also women and girls, especially. Uh, it's, uh, it's very enlightening. And I think we still have two more speakers to go. And I think it will be very even more interesting uh, along the way. And I think without further ado, I'll just uh, introduce again the second speaker, uh, Fitri. Uh, you may have the floor and also the screen, please. Uh, thank you so much, Gilang. Uh, it's such an uh, honor and humble to be here and uh, along with the uh, esteemed uh, speaker, uh, Ambassador uh, Deirdre Kelly. Uh, uh, it's really, uh, really happy to collaborate so far. And, and uh, I thank you, Gilang, for to be the only male uh, in this <laughs> discussion. Uh, usually the situation is not like this, but uh, it's, um, it's, one, uh, it's one of the way that CSIS would like to also commemorate the International Women's Day that will uh, take place uh, 8 of March. Uh, it's still early, and uh, because of that, we want to frame the issue that we think it's particularly important. I would like like now to share uh, my screen. Um, I think uh, I will try. Uh, is it? Can you all see the screen? Yep. All right. Um, uh, uh, I will start with the brief uh, trends, how it is, and I will focus on the journalists, uh, how they are challenged and how uh, in the context of Southeast Asia, why being a female journalist is challenging in the issues right now. Uh, not only for women, it has been challenging because of the uh, education and work has been uh, moved online as well as uh, women are um, stereotypically uh, burdened with domestic care and child rearing. rearing. They are uh, they're obliged or pushed to go online, uh, sometimes without adequate support, um, training and uh, capacity and technology that would enable and uh, support in their safety. Um, so I, I want to share with you how the trends of internet penetration, which still um, not it's it's getting better because of the and, and I think uh, because of the uh, the COVID pandemic uh, last year has pushed us to move online. I think the number of uh, internet um, access for uh, male and female would be increased. In uh, in the Asia Pacific, it's uh, around fifty percent, and the, for women, it's still forty uh, percent. And I think. Um, I think this would actually impact to what it calls a digital divide. Uh, if you don't have the tools, you don't know how to use it. If you don't know how to use it, how can you be equipped to know uh, to be safe and how to cultivate the technology in a way that it's uh, um, improving and uh, sustaining, uh, pushing the, the, the welfare and um, education, uh, especially for women that are, you know, uh, move to have to teach their um, 
uh, children online. But I would focus now on the, the impact on, on the journalists and how they, they work are uh, impacted uh, in, this, uh, in this digital world. There has been tr trends of the, uh, the issue of uh, framing the, the discourse of, of what is the truth and then and we're just, we know that we're in the post-truth world. And then there are uh, issues of, of COVID that, that uh, if we are in the fine line of, of sharing what's, what's true and what's not. And I know government have this big responsibility to, to ensure that the health uh, messages uh, are conveyed in a, in a way that is safe for the people. But of course, that would also impact uh, the, the, the freedom online as well. And, and uh, perhaps it can be not uh, really uh, uh, be um, you know, uh, accepted well in the journalism world. This is a report uh, by survey done by the Columbia University uh, Center of Journalism and Tower Center of Digital Journalism and see how the, the, uh, the pandemic impact the, the, uh, the world. And, uh, and of course, people are now uh, relying on the internet to get information and, uh, and also doing uh, research and, 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 and therefore, um, what we have the interaction before that is in the physical world move to the digital uh, world. And, and this uh, needs to be, uh, people uh, need to be equipped. And it's not only, uh, not only men, because previously, as we see in the in the previous statistic, men have um, most of the access, and now we have to do the education uh, for women as well, especially those that is working and educating remotely. Uh, and uh, the this uh, I would highlight the the issues that is faced uh, by female journalists and how they have uh, faced. Um, the, the violent online and then they are uh, targeted not only because what they say but also because they're women and um, uh, this uh, would be perhaps not so much this is a trend of. Uh, the world and we somehow hope that it's not uh, something that we see in the region but is this something that we are um, uh, need to be concerned of because if journalists have the, are those that are really uh, tech savvy they know what they're doing and they uh, are ideally equipped but this uh, this uh, if this happened to them perhaps what would this be if it uh, happen to a regular uh, person of women that are not knowing the trends and, and the knowledge and not having the access to voice uh, their concern and safety. And uh, now we uh, see how the, the gender gap in uh, Southeast Asia uh, and, uh, and the Asia Pacific, uh, the gender gap is, uh, I think has been, uh, increase somewhat. Uh, I think uh, this this is true because uh, the the welfare is not trickled down and enjoyed effectively. But it's we're we're not too bad, I guess, compared to other region in the world that have the gap more than uh, ten percent. We have our gap is only seven percent. But uh, in a narrative uh, view, what does this mean? Uh, the the research, the report uh, uh, that's compiled. Um, in the in the e economy, uh, because ASEAN is seeing more of the digital tools and the cyber world are mostly in a way uh, of enhancing economy uh, and um, welfare of, of the people of ASEAN. It sees that uh, the internet uh, has been uh, very attractive. A number of 40 million people came online the first time uh, this uh, past year. And uh, it brings the, the region to have 70% of the total population online uh, amounted to 400 million, uh, which because of the pandemic, uh, because they cannot go for, uh, freely or safely uh, to do trading, the, 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 uh, the uh, commerce, the, the, the trade uh, move online. And uh, the, the, the trend uh, that is um, uh, quite capturing the market is uh, the food delivery on online payment. 
and and there is some some uh, issues that relate to this uh, in terms of uh, cyber security of the user as well as uh, um, the knowledge that uh, doing business uh, how to do business safely uh, on uh, online and and also how to use uh, the pay payment uh, so in, with increasing access of course there is increasing uh, vulnerabilities uh, and and of course uh, that also pushed by uh, people are more uh, uh, active in their devices uh, with the, uh, the imposed lockdown. So um, uh, as mentioned before, what does it mean if we have a gender gap uh, present? Uh, although we know that not all schools are open uh, in uh, ten, uh, Southeast Asian country, for example, in Indonesia, we're still having until this, um, at least this uh, semester, we still have the education online and uh, then women that have to help the, the children to to um, access education online needs to have um, the knowledge on how they can do that safely as well as not uh, revealing their identity and their child and 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 that would be difficult uh, understanding that there is a digital gender gap and and this um, is impact to this impacted to the space of, of disparities that's avail, uh, that we can see in the educational and literacy. And we see how, for example, in the research that um, female academic now uh, that is in universities or um, Think tank. I couldn't say it for myself, but they are uh, pressured to uh, they, their productivity level is slowing down because they have to actually uh, uh, have additional burden of taking care of the house as well as taking care of the, educa the education, the child education online, and that's actually uh, give pressure to their productivity. Uh, the second is the lack of digital skill. Uh, then uh, often uh, those for those that is not used to use the tools online, uh, they have this fear. Uh, using that digital technology and how to respond is sometimes not all government able, uh, especially uh, to actually suggest uh, or to, to provide access of the digital tools. Uh, as well as there's not enough time to learn digital skills because um, because as I told you, if the parental and family responsibility and suddenly the COVID happened and suddenly the school goes online, there's not enough time uh, to uh, do the training. Uh, and what has been concerning is the increase of online harassment uh, and online abuse. Uh, and this includes with the sexual base and gender base uh, violence that uh, takes place. Uh, in Indonesia, for example, the National Commission uh, uh, against um, uh, violence against women actually reported that because of the pandemic, uh, the, the the abuse experienced by women online, uh, uh, the gender-based uh, uh, violence online increased 300%. And um, this is a reality that uh, is, is, is very sad. Um, and uh, then with this, uh, in relation to uh, the, the, the COVID pandemic and the spread of the, the, new, the uh, misinformation and disinformation, of course, uh, countries would like to have uh, regulation in place to, uh, to prevent um, uh, non-true or hoax news, disinformation and inf uh, misinformation. Uh, but to what extent this uh, actually uh, conflict with the freedom of of um, expression online. And, and for example, there's uh, uh, several countries of ASEAN that I mentioned here on how they uh, create the cyber law. And, and uh, maybe the word censor is um, quite strong here, uh, but I think it's it would enable the government to actually uh, 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 would uh, choose the news that would uh, create uh, social havoc to actually control them. Um, and and uh, I think if, if the 10 ASEAN uh, countries to be, to be, to be mentioned, I, I'm not fair by not mentioning all, I would uh, maybe say out loud how Indonesia and Malaysia, uh, Farlina is here, maybe uh, she can check me later, but Indonesia, we have the Electronic Information and Transaction Law uh, 2013 that is amended in 2016. Uh, that is used by um, people um, perhaps that is, uh, 
uh, oknums or, or people that uh, wanted to uh, use uh, the law to stretch for their own benefit. And unfortunately, um, CSIS uh, did a research on on uh, the the how the law is implemented, and they are uh, their victims uh, that are women that are framed because they just don't know how to uh, actually state their opinion online, uh, and that uh, then uh, because of this uh, a knowledge, uh, the lack of knowledge, they are uh, then being. Um, being uh, uh, criminalized, and, and and this is something that I think we can uh, work uh, with uh, or, or uh, to together collaborate in in providing uh, education and how on uh, how the countries where where the people are living uh, created law and how um, digital uh, safety security what should and should not be stated online or. Uh, uh, and perhaps that would be useful as well uh, to have a certain standard uh, on uh, on how to actually judge a post online. For example, I want to share uh, how the civil society in Indonesia, um, uh, SafeNet, for example, uh, civil society organization, collaborate with the National uh, Human Rights Institute, Komnas uh, Ham, uh, of Human Rights Commission in Indonesia. Uh, in the end of last year, I uh, created a standard of uh, 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 in, uh, digital. Uh, 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 posting or crime and uh, to, to actually give the police uh, a standard on how to judge a social media posting or internet posting whether this is violating the law or not because previously um, uh, just like normal people police doesn't have the standard to uh, actually judge uh, what's a crime uh, the crime that is previously physical and goes online. So I think having the standard would also uh, be useful for, for uh, and, and educating the standard also useful for both sides, which is uh, uh, the people and also uh, the security um, uh, of, uh, forces. Uh, and uh, there would, uh, of course, an incident had happened uh, to the journalists and activists and their uh, women, uh, and then uh, they're uh, unfortunately also uh, subjected to uh, their gen gender and not only with what the news that they uh, uh, write. Uh, and uh, but not to give you such a bleak overview, I guess uh, I want to quote the UN Women Executive Director uh, 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 statement that uh, uh, COVID-19 has been dis disruptive global force in a generation and our generation. And when there is disruption, there is a potential to rebuild, reimagine and create a radically better world. Uh, we can allow the, the crisis to enforce the worst impact to the digital gender divide, or we can use the crisis to accelerate change, expand hor horizon, and get uh, millions of girls and women online. And if I would like, if I can add, to equip them uh, to, to not just uh, survive, but thrive and be successful using uh, uh, these digital uh, tools. So uh, this is the recommendation I, I uh, raise uh, that uh, I think we need to give uh, the education uh, for the people, most importantly, the people that works with news uh, and advocacy, such as journalists and human rights defender, uh, knowledge and how to secure themselves uh, better to uh, to, so they can guide their uh, information online and their presence online. So they're not uh, uh, more prone to doxing. Doxing is how the information are uh, being uh, spread online. So the people can just attack them uh, from not only online, but, but physical because their address might be stated online. And, um, and they are actually knowledge that their, uh, their helpline and on the digital security to, to actually provide education of best practices and best application and, and software on what to use to ensure cyber security. Talking about security, right? In the gender field, sometimes uh, women are not being told to, 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 
to deal or converse in the security um, situation or on and they they sometimes are positioned as the weak and therefore i think i think we need to actually view this from an agency perspective that can, they can be empowered they can be uh, be a, uh, an agent of change and and they can uh, be the one that can uh, uh, give edu as they are currently an educator now they, they can be equipped to to help uh, to secure themselves and secure their children and family uh, online and um, and uh, I think there are uh, an, um, education that can be used to to help the the communication, for example, the school, uh, the education uh, platform to know the communication online and, and uh, to keep the, uh, and also the public to know what uh, sensitive information is and not to spread it online. Oh, sorry. And, uh, and, uh, and for, for, uh, for actually uh, the media and the people to actually create a, a collaboration to uh, counter misinformation, disinformation, uh, hoax. Um, I think uh, this is the, this is what uh, this is the report and the, the, the boxes that I can uh, show uh, that can be used uh, online. And uh, in terms of recommendation, uh, there are several reports that have been uh, made in terms how we can uh, make women uh, and all the people to be uh, safe online. Uh, for example, uh, in the short term, the UNESCO report saying we can do, uh, we can have a gender sensitive peer support network, uh, access to legal assistance if there's uh, ever a need, uh, then a workplace policy uh, to create, on uh, to prevent online violence, and as well as what uh, Ambassador Deidre Kelly was mentioning, maybe um, support women to speak up online and allow uh, places i know there's a uh, tips and and in if the room full of people we can actually mention the name of a person that we want them to encourage them to speak more uh they, they should be a guidelines how to deal with the violence uh and having access to digital security expert to actually share the knowledge access to counseling service to support that uh, those that need to affect it and also uh, the government can uh, promote their own I believe the government with the COVID pandemic already gives us a lot of stimulus package to help uh, the micro small and medium enterprises to digitalize online um, and then uh, then this uh, promotion can also be used uh, not only for businesses but also for people to to uh, to ensure their safety uh, online when they're doing e-commerce and or e-transaction. Uh, we uh, I think we need to also uh, collaborate with the platform to help them uh, accountable and ask for them help to to deal with hate speech. Um, especially those that uh, aim at women, uh, journalists, and civil societies, uh, activists to to take down the the in, the information that related to uh, hate speech or uh, spill of uh, per private information. Uh, they they should be proactive and not only reactive to do block later, but I, I guess this needs a further collaboration. And uh, the incentives should be implemented. So this is something that we need to think, how could we have this intense uh, incentive be online, you know, how to encourage women to work in the sec tech sector, because I know uh, women are, are often, uh, I mean, more uh, recently, we have women encouraged to enter STEM, but that maybe that would only happen in the advanced countries. And, and maybe we have to also um, have this program as well in the developing countries. And then what is the incentive for that? And how we don't want any backlash as well, and how we move want to have the whole population, including the men, and also everybody to be included in this as well, and not to have, it feels like competition, uh, unfair competition. And uh, there are uh, also research uh, by consultant uh, that actually uh, this uh, on the right side, maybe it's too small for you, it's a report on the uh, Southeast Asia woman uh, uh, activity in ICPs uh, done by the Boston Consulting Groups in, in, uh, to see what's most effective uh, to, uh, to support women to study technology. The first is perhaps exposing uh, the students to, to know their 
career opportunities and I expose them with tech subjects. And, and the challenge is not all schools are having the capacity, uh, the facilities to support a student to attend a tech subject, especially. And then because if they don't have the capacity, how can they encourage even women to enter? And then having uh, participation of women as student in promoting uh, a higher education in tax. Of course, scholarship uh, would be uh, beneficial uh, and uh, having female role models also uh, be useful. I think I've been uh, speaking enough and this is uh, with this, I thank you. Uh, I uh, return the screen uh, to Gilang, thank you. Thank you very much, Fitri, uh, very interesting presentation, uh, especially on highlighting the challenges faced by female journalists um, on the cyberspace and within digital media reporting. Also several descriptions on the cyber laws within Southeast Asia um, and how they uh, impact uh, society as a whole. I think it will be very interesting to see how um, these cyber laws that are enacted by the various ASEAN member states, how it affects um, between genders, um, whether the states or the government not actively, actively, but how how many, for example, female are uh, not arrested, but uh, taken into account by the law. How many males? If there are any gender gaps, etc. I think in Indonesia we've seen a lot of reports within this uh, instances. For example, with the uh, ITE law, uh, where um, people who are abused, who 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 express their uh, torments online, are 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 being held accountable because they're they're spreading hate speech or they they're defaming their um, particular, uh, uh, the, so the victims becomes the, uh, becomes the perpetrators in this instance. So it's very interesting to see how this can be translated into the research, but this is just my two cents. Uh, okay, well, it, without, my, without further ado, I think uh, it's best to introduce the last speaker for the webinar, uh, Farlina Said, uh, you have the screen, please. Hello, okay, hold on. I'm gonna try to share my screen first. All right, okay, wait, um, let me try this. You've got the screen? How do I actually present this? Okay. Ah, all right. Oh, shucks. Oh, dear. Okay. Okay, so, um, Your yeah, Excellency, my esteemed hosts, uh, participants, ladies and gentlemen, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you may be at this moment. And firstly, I wish to convey my appreciation to the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Indonesia for this opportunity to speak on a matter that would impact us in one way or another. So my name is Farlina, an analyst in foreign policy and security studies at the Institute of Strategic and International Studies, Malaysia. And I uh, thank CSIS for this opportunity to explore ideas of gender, gender main mainstreaming, cyber and its repercussions. So. Perhaps picking up from some of the points that Dr. Fitri has actually raised, um, the statistics can be pretty stark on the negative impacts of cyberspace on women, particularly with gender-based violence. Among the statistics highlighted would actually be uh, UNESCO's 2020 finding on the of the 901 female journalists interviewed, 73% uh, experience online violence, accompanying which is that 20% of the online violence have traversed offline. My pre presentation hopes to complement the base set forth by Dr. Fritri and, and I feel like there would actually be many convergences in how we do, how we would actually um, suggest uh, ways forward, um, but we will actually explore that as it goes on. So to highlight other findings in this space and perhaps to pick up on something that Gilang actually just mentioned earlier when it comes to cyberbullying and perhaps um, women, uh, perhaps people actually becoming perpetrators in this space. Um, and also mentioned by Her Excellency on the different experiences of those using uh, cyber. In binary conversations or gender, research by um, Huang and Cho, also Wang et al, she state that while males are more likely to be victimized in traditional bullying than females, females are more likely to be victimized in cyber bullying than males. However, such situations are actually not so simple. A systemic analysis of cyberbullying in Southeast Asia, uh, Southeast, Southeast Asian countries by uh, Rang Napakul in 2019 surveyed 21 studies on cyberbullying in Southeast Asia to find that studies reflected no great differences in the experience of victimizer or perpetrator divided along gender lines. 
as some of the research found that cyberbullying can be impacted by cognitive or affective empathy, offline experience, and uh, an environment or previous experiences with cyberbullying. However, further research in other parts of the world actually highlights a relationship between traditional bullying, anger, rumination, and cyberbullying that differs for both males and females. So the structure, I will actually explain a little bit further, a, a little later on the structure of cyber that actually further perpetrates this type of uh, anger, rumination. Um, but generally, an example is that uh, previous cyberbullying experience and anger rumination increases the risk of cyberbullying perpetra perpetration, while traditional bullying victimization, which means that if you're actually bullied offline, will increase the risk of cyberbullying perpetration among female victims. The experience can actually differ along male and uh, female experiences. Thus, it would actually impact policies ways forward. Um, the second thing that would actually be notable in regards to cyber and uh, women is the impact of the gig economy on women. And I believe it was actually mentioned earlier about the role of cyber um, or digitalization that actually allows women to participate and contribute in, in, in earning income for their families while actually fulfilling it alongside um, their own domestic roles. So an area analysis of panel data for 156 countries um, spanning from 1991 to 2014 actually concluded that digital technologies do contribute to narrowing the gender gap in labor market participation by women. However, automation and the fourth industrial revolution can actually change a lot of these uh, findings in the sense that uh, labors in sectors such as retail or business process outsourcing utilize low skilled um, women uh, as laborers, which can actually be replaced in, in as the as digitalization processes carry forth. This is mainly uh, impacted due to the, uh, the lack of women participation in high skilled technical jobs or unequal access of men and women into information and technical and vocational training, which was actually mentioned by Fitri earlier. So, in addition, um, some of the uh, female entrepreneurs in ASEAN actually tend to own small businesses where the tendency to digitize um, can, be, uh, can, can be low. So this could hamper the possibility of economic growth as much as I believe it was quoted around um, USD 89 billion per year in the Asia Pacific, with should there be more female labor force participation. Uh, the last part, I would actually just touch a little bit on uh, some cybersecurity data and women and how cyberspace is also a domain for information and community um, where women would use cyberspace to in attain information where and the, thus the avail availability of such information would actually be needed, particularly the some of the information uh, concerns health or other matters. Additionally, uh, as applications are there's an app for everything, right? Are developed, catered to women. The management of data and data security is needed to protect women online. A report by the Association for Progressive Communication and Women's International League for Peace and Freedom submitted to the United Nations Open-Ended Working Group stated that data breaches can have specific impact for women's privacy, particularly as personal data breaches can be related to sexual and reproductive health rights, dignity, and self-development. Cited in the report was a data breach at a public health system in Brazil, which compromised the details of around 15,926 mothers, 4,237 abortions, and 181 stillbirths. As abortion is illegal in Brazil, the possibility of potential criminal charges and additional emotional damage adds to the responsibilities for authorities to actually manage data, uh, authorities as well as um, the private sector to actually manage data and ensure that cybersecurity practices are high. So some things to consider about uh, cyber and offline consider uh, and the offline considerations perhaps exacerbating this type of um, gender experiences online. Uh, alluded by Fitri is actually about a post -truth. So the first one that she concerns about the structure of cyber as a medium of communication. So while traditional media can be authoritative and one-sided in the presentation of views, cyber and the structure of Web 2.0 or now Web 4.0 allows for fluid communication and exchanges in what can be considered public domain. Two users can actually present views that can be equally legitimate 
this increases the ease of sharing information, but this also means that sharing of falsified information or defamation is also easier. As two voices collide, the trends on post-truth impacts the way information is digested. In addition, as social networking becomes a mainstay of every individual's life and technology software such as deepfakes proliferate, the protection of women or, any, or anyone in this space uh, in that matter is actually quite important and it should actually address the technological nuances and developments. Um, the second one would actually be in regards to the offline environmental factors that would impact the protection of women. So environmental factors can actually concern psychological underpinnings, motivation or offline factors that could exacerbate situations such as cyberbullying. For instance, the, um, the research on anger rumination, um, where traditional bullying and cyberbullying uh, is actually placed alongside uh, and the, the extent of um, the cycle of uh, bullying when it comes to anger, anger rumination, uh, it actually uh, displays how events in cyberspace could actually impact offline behaviors. And perhaps some of these can actually be considered by Southeast Asian nations to actually understand the nuances of, uh, of cyberbullying and how you, it can be addressed because the experiences do differ in accordance to um, gender lines. The issue of access also has great great repercussions in cyber, particularly given that women's access to devices can be limited. In addition, uh, and uh, in addition, an abridging program is perhaps needed to introduce such devices as tools to generate additional income, particularly there could be a gap between women's participation in science, technology, engineering, and mathematical sectors. As the gig economy can be in formal sectors, the protection of the labor force would require due considerations. Um, these offline factors tied to security could be, could be opportunities for the worst using technological means. For instance, digital services such as ride sharing can be dangerous for women if already crime rates against women are high in, in any given country. Thus, technology can actually present uh, opportunities, but it, it can also present great challenges in using it. Um, lastly, in, in regards to the collection of information and, uh, and a little bit on data governance, uh, sharing sensitive or personal information can present challenges. Data protection policies would have to be addressed, which could be inclusive of security by design norms and programs that could build awareness on cyber hygiene. Uh, law and regulation for the processing of data would have to address concerns of data process abroad, responsibilities of data process to artificial intelligence and enforcement. And also uh, mentioned by Dr. Fitri are the movements in this, in this space um, in regards to cyber laws and uh, how the cyber laws in the region are actually still developing. Thus, uh, perhaps as uh, the cyber laws actually do develop, I actually consider some of the areas uh, when it comes to data by security, uh, security by design norms and uh, practices, it would actually create a secure environment for the protection of women. So trying to actually harmonize some of these um, presentation, I actually do come up with a table that, um, that would hopefully uh, display some of the, uh, would actually gather some of the thoughts and arguments in a more cohesive or coherent manner. So some of the cyber uh, or offline conversations uh, and considerations as I actually mentioned earlier uh, that actually do perpetrate things like cyber bullying is the ease of actually sharing information online whether the information is actually true or is untrue the environmental factors such as um, the traditional bullying the cycle of traditional bullying anger rumination as well as uh, cyber bullying can actually perpetuate itself thus this actually plays a role um, when it comes to uh, the, the experience building the experience of um, people online Possible remedies, sorry, possible remedies, remedies in this situation. So due to the complexity of issues on things like cyberbullying, the need to like explore gendered experience would uncover the nuances of these issues. Thus, research would actually be recommended. Um, the role to technological platforms, as perhaps indicated by uh, Fitri earlier, is uh, uh, along the lines of um, is to hold platforms accountable when it comes to some of these conversations on protection of um, women uh, online. This is mainly because of um, the, the third point that I actually placed there, which comes, um, which speaks about the proficiency of cyber court government agencies and laws. The, because uh, the, the need to strengthen the capacities of cyber courts and building awareness on penalties of behavior would be useful. However, uh, because the um, 
legal redress in these areas can actually be slow. And there may actually be issues when it comes to definitions or cyberbullying. For instance, uh, is there a difference between criticizing and bullying? And how does this actually, um, how, how would uh, in, uh, sufficient protection actually seem like uh, when it comes to people actually using cyberspace? Um, does more conversations actually do need to be held, particularly given that uh, resources can actually be quite limited? Um, so the second, when it comes to the protection and participation of women in the gig economy, um, having meaningful access to devices is actually quite important, particularly because uh, should you actually have a phone, but you're actually using the phone to um, to only communicate socially, which is actually important, but but uh, lacking the, the means to participate in the gig economy, then you there would actually be a lesser experience for anybody who actually do would hope to participate in, in uh, digitalization. Uh, secondly, would be that uh, women in the gig the gig economy can actually be quite informal, and when it's informal, then that means the sufficient sufficient protections actually do have to be addressed. Um, the third is that uh, the offline safety can actually be compromised, particularly, and this is actually dependent on uh, already the levels of uh, gender-based violence in the nation. While uh, the last point actually concerns uh, women, women's participation in STEM that actually that would determine the role of women participation in in this in gig economies. So the possible remedies would actually be um, quite uh, quite. Uh, abroad in the sense, firstly, that would actually, the, the conversation actually goes back to access and uh, protection of critical infrastructure, particularly to actually ensure that access is ongoing um, and to ensure that levels of cybersecurity practices would be, would be um, of, of, a, of a high level. Um, uh, mention the labor policies for the gig economy, I think is still unfolding when it comes to uh, Southeast Asia. And then lastly, it would be the promotion and outreach for women to participate in the economy, which I think uh, Dr. Petri has actually already uh, healthily discussed that in the tiny table that I actually noticed at the side so that, that we can actually visit that later perhaps. Um, Lastly would be uh, the information and personal data usage where there can actually be personal and sensitive information that's shared by women online. And there is actually a need to ensure that data protection policies are actually up to date um, and also are enforceable and would actually have uh, its its uh, its enforcement bodies. So the does the possible remedies actually concerns data protection, building awareness on cyber. Um, so the next, I would actually speak a little about maybe perhaps uh, just to throw some ideas when it comes to international cooperation or cooperation in these sectors. So um, mentioned by Her Excellencies are the activities of the ASEAN Regional Forum, also in this space that frames the normative discussions, uh, be it in, in terms of practice or structures. Uh, regionally, the ASEAN Commission on the Promotion and Protection for the Rights of Women and Children have con conducted programs to address the elimination of online-based violence against women and violence against children particularly to review emerging legislation and legal inform enforcement in this space. As the region raises its digital enforcement cap capacities, greater improvements can also can be made. Um, the women, peace and security agenda in this region is actually um, quite interesting. So cyber feature cross-cutting issues that would require various roles and mitigation from stakeholders. Uh, WPS programs have considered the roles of women in peace processes and building community resilience, particularly for security issues such as uh, radicalization. Um, the framing can be expanded to include cyber, particularly to link indicators of online gender-based violence with community resilience, um, thus, uh, which would actually uh, lead to perhaps program programmatic approaches to women participation whether these would actually be in policies or whether this would actually be as a role lead, uh, as leaders in their community. So um, women participation in policies can increase the influence or gender perspective, which would open the pathway for nuanced nuance policies and frameworks. Um, programs that could build women professionally, such as uh, gender assertiveness training, circulate, uh, circulate resources, um, uh, programs that could circulate resources, that can build networks or open opportunities for participation at crucial international discussions would be useful to increase the profile of women in these sectors. Um, 
so these would actually concern a lot of uh, resource sharing um, also about best practices. Uh, I think that would actually be the last of my slides. Uh, yeah, so these are actually some of the research that's cited in case anybody would actually want to take a look like some of these papers are really brilliant at what they do. So um, I will actually probably pass this to Petri later so she can circulate. So with that, I actually probably I will finish sharing here. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Farlina, for the enlightening presentation. I think uh, there's a lot of uh, areas that you covered, uh, especially, um, for example, uh, how industry is impacted uh, on uh, women's in gig economy, how automation and industry 4.0 would might be able to push aside some of these women uh, from their jobs. And then you talked about uh, several instances of data breaches, uh, for example, in public health, which is something that is very, uh, very serious uh, 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 conduct, and I cannot agree more uh, when we, we talk about increasing cyber hygiene. That's a, I think it's the first time I hear about it, but it, it instantly makes very good sense on the conduct norms and role on how society would would, would treat their uh, their data and also anything that within the cyberspace in a very uh, cohesive and also very uh, tidy manner, I suppose. So it was very uh, uh, very elaborate, very, uh, very, very succinct as well, and thank you. And uh, with this, I'd like to open up the discussion. Uh, I myself have several um, things I'd like to ask to the panelists, if I may, uh, before I open up the Q&A. Um, I, I have a question to Ambassador Kelly uh, regarding the comment about the norms, Canada's focus on, the, on building norms of responsible state behavior in cyberspace. And, and it instantly came to my mind whether uh, when we come to talk about hard security, a lot of countries also talk about building norms um, to either to build, build, build certain groupings or something like the quad is something is similar to having norms, but this is a cyberspace manner. My question would be in, a, in, in the sense that when we talk about building norms with the, with the other states, when Canada tried to build bridges of, of, of cyberspace norms, um, whether there is a line to be drawn uh, on certain states' behavior uh, in regards with the cyberspace, uh, with whether there are uh, countries that, by, for in, in Canada's perspective, uh, cannot be or 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 very different in in, in conducting um, cyberspace behavior. Indonesia is a country where, in my personal point of view, we conduct a lot of our cyberspace uh, policies in a very, uh, I would say confused manner, <laughs> but I think some of my colleagues would be able to present it better. Uh, it, it, and, and what I'm saying is that it's very, I suppose, different to a country like Canada. And I, and I The screen has frozen, uh, Gilang, so I'm, I'm not sure if it's frozen on, on my end or on, on your end. So I'll just start speaking in hope that I'm, I'm not cutting anybody off. Uh, Fitri, I see you. Can you hear me? I, I hear you. I was like trying to uh, see Gilang as well. I think he, he's, he cut off. Um, maybe if um, uh, I think um, we hear a little bit what Gillan were asking uh, for the first question for you. Uh, sure. Would you mind to answer the question? Uh, sure, not a problem. Oh, uh, uh, he's left and oh, come back, uh, but I'll start yeah, answering. And if back. there's if there's anything that I missed, then uh, then he can you know ask me to to supplement my response. But you know, I think in terms of of developing norms, I think. You know, Canada is involved at, at various levels. So there are efforts at the United Nations, for example, where there are attempts to create a collective norm uh, in terms of acceptable use uh, of the digital space. Of course, given the challenges that you highlighted, the fact that there are very different uh, legal uh, regimes in place and systems of governance and, uh, you know, very different manners in terms of whether countries use uh, the digital space offensively or not. It can be very, very difficult 
to try to identify uh, a level playing field and um, some common grounds in terms of what is a baseline for acceptable use. But those are, those conversations are very important to have um, in terms of trying to establish some type of acceptable baseline. Uh, so Canada is involved at the United Nations. Uh, it's involved in the ASEAN Regional Forum. Uh, and then, you know, when requested, uh, has conversations on a bilateral level with countries to share our experiences as well in terms of how we manage certain issues. I, and, you know, in terms of the challenges that exist, we highlighted what those are. So it can be something as simple as, well, and it's not simple, I shouldn't say that, but privacy and how people's information is used. So, you know, many people may not realize that when they go on social media and they're watching videos or they're, you know, shopping online or they're sending their family members messages, that that information is being used for different purposes, that it could be used for, you know, determining their their browsing history and patterns. What are the things that they're interested in? Can companies use that to target marketing efforts towards them? Or is it, uh, you know, being used more nefarious? Are there criminals that are able to access that information and, and use it for identity fraud? Uh, and then in many of the other issues. So there's, uh, you know, awareness raising is very important. So even if we can't all agree on what's fair and, and what's acceptable in terms of conduct, you know, then, then information raising becomes equally important so that people are aware of the risks that exist when they're online. Uh, and that they can conduct themselves uh, accordingly. And then in terms of your question regarding, you know, are there countries that cross the line in terms of, um, of their activities, whether that be, as I mentioned, using it offensively and targeting other countries for nefarious purposes, uh, you know, whether it's interference in elections or false information campaigns, um, you can think of a number of examples, hacking into sites to try to access information that's protected under copyright and, and IP legislation. Um, so there's a lot of nasty things that uh, countries, some countries try to do uh, in terms of, you know, has Canada ever identified when they think countries have crossed the line? Yes, absolutely. There have been uh, you would be able to go online uh, and do searches to see when Canada has specifically called out other countries uh, for taking actions against Canadian interests. So just some examples, um, you know, I can think of a time where, where Canada called out Russia for attempting to hack into information in, in Canada to access uh, records, health records of Olympic athletes, for example, or where there have been countries that have tried to hack in and obtain commercially sensitive information, or where countries have disseminated false information uh, about uh, various politicians and leaders. And then, of course, there's the very famous uh, case, uh, you know, of allocations about uh, misconduct in, in elections in certain countries. So, Yes, we have absolutely identified instances where we think that countries have crossed the line uh, and we've called them out for it. Uh, and other countries have continued to do so as well. But, you know, if, if do we have a list of, um, you know, a hit list per se of, of countries that are offenders? Um, no, but it's very carefully examined on a, on a case by case basis. Uh, so that Canada can be comfortable with the level, the burden of proof that we can be absolutely confident uh, that it is a particular state that is taking those actions and why they're taking those actions and what they're trying to get. So it's not a list per se, but it's uh, on a case by case basis. And we do call it out when we think that lines have been crossed. So I'm not sure if that answered your question. If there's anything else that I can add, please let me know. Thank you, Ambassador Kelly, and uh, thanks to you for covering me. I think I was just falling into a digital black hole in the middle of the, you know, discussion. <laughs> but you answered it succinctly, very, very properly as well. I was trying to avoid naming any countries other than mine, and just trying to be a bit more professional. But I, uh, what you touched upon perfectly summed up uh, my question. So thank you for that, Ambassador. And I am. I'll look over with the uh, question. Uh, Q&A section. Now we're, we're starting to receive a number of questions. I'd like to take um, 
I'd like to take three, two questions, two, three questions, I suppose. Uh, we have a question here from uh, Alexa Franca to uh, Fitri, uh, where she stated that, or he stated, I noticed school curriculums, particularly in Indonesia, does not prepare children for social media, despite of the growing digital economy uh, as they're viewed as playtime. Now, Dr. Fitri, how do you think digital literacy should be taught in schools? Um, should schools teach students about appropriate conduct in online spaces to make it safer? for women, girls, and other marginalized groups? That's a question from Alexa Franca. Uh, second, question, uh, second question is from Arizal Jeknanihan. Uh, he asked, uh, as noted in Indonesia and Malaysia, digital violences are perpetuated by a non-gender sensitive legislation such as uh, Undang Undang ITE, ITE law, and anti-pornography law. How do you think the next progress will take place? Should the law be scrapped at all, or should progress focus be be focused more on inconsistent judicial rulings surrounding the implementation? And uh, there was also a question from uh, our head of uh, international relations department, uh, Dr. F Shafia Muhibat. Uh, she asked well, either Farlina or Fitri uh, to present their uh, perspective. Sorry, there's a train coming. Uh, how about digital economy in Southeast Asia? Um, has there been any study regarding gender inequality in benefiting from digital economy uh, within the region? Um, I think uh, either Fitri or Farlina can answer the question. So three questions first. Uh, I don't want to burden everyone with a lot of questions. So um, I'll go with Fitri. I think you can go ahead and uh, give your first uh, thoughts. Thank you. Yilang, that's lots of questions. Uh, uh, I I uh, I am actually intrigued with your um, your question regarding the responsible state behavior in the cyberspace. Uh, Indonesia is one of the country that is currently negotiating and sitting in the United Nations groups of government expert, uh, the twenty country there is to uh, to discuss on uh, how we go about and the future stage of uh, the cyber norms in the world. And um, uh, I think uh, I think it would be interesting to, to note that uh, the number of female participants as the head of delegation is increasing uh, year over year. And uh, I think, um, I think it's important to actually. Sorry, there's a car on my side. Uh, I think I think it is important to to see as well how uh, countries need to actually call out um, those that uh, uh, those countries or non-state actors that are uh, behaving um, non-responsive in the cyberspace because we want cyber and the internet as a platform that is safe and secure. Um, I guess uh, the challenge is as a developing countries and not only Indonesia, but other countries, for example, our neighbor Singapore, if uh, if you got cyber attacks, so the question is what benefit if, uh, do you get if you state that your country is under attack, right? And it would be better perhaps not to say that we're under attack because uh, because it would then say that uh, the, in the country infrastructure is not safe. But... Uh, I guess uh, I guess what Canada did to actually note that uh, certain countries that are not behaving responsibly uh, need to be supported as well, so they don't repeat uh, such action. Um, okay, uh, now I would like to answer uh, Alexa Franca question. Thank you. Uh, uh, in Indonesia, of course, not uh, country, uh, not school, not all schools are equipped to teach uh, technology because we know there are even country, uh, uh, sorry, there are even school, uh, especially in the rural area uh, that have not yet uh, managed to move its platform digitally. Uh, there are, uh, however, some countries that are more uh, accessible and have uh, uh, more access to technology and they uh, actually have encouraged students to use um, uh, the digital platform for students and uh, for uh, for my knowledge, uh, schools in the in the capitals and big cities actually already uh, tell their students to upload their. Um, uh, project and program to YouTube and see, for example, oh, I say, uh, I, I mentioned, uh, oh, so to a certain social media platform and ask for likes, for example, that kind of thing, whether it's good or bad, actually encourage uh, how a student to uh, be active in social media. But 
how do you, how do I think digital literacy should be taught at school? I think uh, school needs to be um, uh, need to give uh, uh, information uh, first and foremost and the safety how they can be safe in the digital uh, world what information they can uh, uh, state in publicly and what information they could keep in private um, and uh, that I think it's important as well as uh, school need to uh, give I, I know there are school that give education not only to students but also to their parents in supporting their student uh, uh, to uh, to learn uh, uh, online as uh, that's the trend since last year at least in Indonesia um, uh, uh, whether sh uh, school should have the appropriate conduct uh, online uh, in the online space. I think uh, that uh, is advisable. I think I agree with that. And, and I think the way uh, schools can do this is using the UNESCO guidelines in terms how uh, and at terms of how uh, to uh, protect, uh, protect uh, the information of uh, children in the digital world. Uh, and they issued it last year because uh, they're aware, UNESCO is aware there's a lot of education going online and uh, schools can adopt from the UNESCO, uh, uh, the U, sorry, UNICEF report uh, in terms of how uh, they can uh, have guidelines on how to be safe online for students and parents. Uh, uh, is there anything else I miss, Gilang? I haven't, I haven't unmuted myself. Yeah, uh, there's a question from Arizal talking about the, um, the digital violence that are perpetuated by non-gender sensitive legislation. We talked about Undang-Undang ITE, we talked about anti-pornography law as well. Uh, Arizal is asking whether, you know, these laws, these cyber laws, what uh, what's your take on these laws, whether they should be scrapped altogether? Are there supposed to be a reformation on this law or or we just move on and start to create, a, you know, an amendment or something different to, to this law? Uh, thank you, Gilang. I was thinking that Arizal question will be uh, deflected to Farlina because he also answer, asked about Malaysia. Uh, but yeah, uh, I want to answer. Uh, of course, uh, I, I believe that say, any government ha have been trying the best in they possibly can in terms of uh, creating, formulating legislation. But we have to be aware as well that the, the speed of the digital technology and how digi uh, digital tools has been used has always been faster than uh, how regulation is created. Of course, we need to review the legislation periodically and see whether that is relevant uh, with our progress in technology. So uh, scrapping might not uh, be the word, but I think uh, having it reviewed and improved to be relevant and, um, and um, as well as uh, protect those that need to be protected and uh, punish those that uh, need to be punished is uh, what regulation should be. Uh, I think I return, I think that's my answer. I return to the moderator. Thank you. Good. Thank you, Fiti. Uh, Farlina, would you like to chip in? Sure. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity and also for the question. Um, I think to probably just add a little bit uh, to uh, in future's perspective when it comes to the law, I actually do agree that maybe scrapping it may not actually be the correct word. Um, I would actually uh, think that there are more conversations that actually need to be held about the implementation or even when it comes to awareness raising that actually comes with these laws. So I think in Malaysia, you may actually be looking at like things like um, the sexual Offenses Against Children Act 2017, um, where some of the issues actually would concern how um, the shortage of, say, ju the judicial interpretation or some of the implementation, or even when it comes to the awareness, um, should there be a, a registry of people who are convicted of crimes on, on child pornography? Like, would people, would the employers actually refer to things like that? So it actually does concern a bit of awareness and um, uh, and. Uh, maybe greater communication of the usage and of, of um, building the normative environment for, for these kind of issues. Um, I think uh, probably there, there I'm 
there was another question, um, I think a, a little below, oh, no, wait, I don't think you actually asked me that yet. So I'll actually probably address that a little bit later. I will actually address on the perspective when it comes to a digital inequality in Southeast Asia, particularly when it comes to women. So I found like a healthy um, dose of literature from Iria. I believe last year they actually published a few um, reports when it comes to uh, digital inequality, um, uh, women participation and Southeast Asia, and this was actually done with Australia Aid. So um, perhaps uh, I would, I'm actually able to share some of the, some of the reports and later if that would actually be useful. I do hope this actually answers the question. Okay, thank you. I uh, noted Ambassador Kelly has raised her hand. Uh, please Ambassador. Sorry, my my microphone refused to unmute. I just wanted to follow up in terms of the publications that were available and it's timely. This week, I received an email from ERIA. Uh, and for those of you that are not familiar with ERIA, it's the Economic Research Institute for ASEAN and East Asia. Uh, and they have come up with some new uh, publications based uh, regarding some of the issues that we've addressed. So specifically, they have a new one on women's participation in the digital economy, improving access to skills, entrepreneurship and leadership across ASEAN. And there's also a discussion paper on gender digital equality across ASEAN. So in addition to the publications that were out last year, uh, they also have a new series of publications that are coming out looking at some of those uh, issues related to economic development uh, and skills acquisition, particularly is relevant to Industry 4.0. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Kelly. Uh, just one Another question here we have from Nikki. Uh, this is a question that are uh, that's uh, attributed to all the panelists, so everyone can chip in. Um, so she stated that number of online gender-based violence towards women in Indonesia has increased significantly during the pandemic. Um, now the situation is even worse for women as they become the victim of domestic and uh, dating violence. So they face double threats to COVID-19 in public context and also violence within the private context. Uh, reflecting on the situation faced by many women within Indonesia, and I suppose we'll take it into another country's as well perspective, um, how do we create and maximize a system that can help these women? Um, not to mention that there's also digital surveillance that happened and within an internet limitation that may limit uh, women's access as well. Uh, I think I'll just uh, straight give this to all the panelists. I'll reverse in reverse or order. I think I will we'll go with Farlina first. Please, Farlina, you would like to chip in on this uh, question? Uh, sure. I think uh, actually the, the part that I found most interesting about the question was uh, in regards to the, okay, wait, let me bring the question back up, uh, is in regards to uh, the digital surveillance and internet limitation uh, when it comes to um, women's access. Uh, and if it's possible, I would actually want to tailor um, my, my response to that because I think some of the interesting perspectives when it comes to access for women and devices, uh, there has to be greater conversation about the limitations um, that is standing in the way to women actually utilizing the devices or to having access to some of this infrastructure. Because if we're actually looking at internet limitation, are we actually looking at um, perhaps censorship of some of the information or are we actually looking at the lack of infrastructure that is um, further widened due to the uh, role of women? Um, I will actually outline in the sense that, because let's say if states were to actually um, roll out a program for there to be a greater connectivity in communities, in rural communities, then what you actually may get is uh, maybe a, a center, a, a computer center or an ICT center where people would actually be able to participate or use uh, internet facilities. But this, but women who may actually have domestic roles may not be able to go to these type of places because they are actually, um, they would actually be required to actually stay at home. So. There, I think the question is actually quite nuanced in the sense that there is, uh, there, uh, there should, there can be further studies. I think on where uh, some of these limitations are and where these limitations um, can can lead. Uh, yeah, and I, I think uh, when it comes to uh, 
things like uh, digital surveillance. I think I would actually echo um, Your Excellency's point earlier when it comes to sometimes the sharing of information and then the awareness on the sharing of information is actually particularly important. Um, I think digital surveillance uh, also reiterated in regards to say that, that it, uh, if you're actually looking at say uh, the journalists and actually like the digital surveillance experienced by journalists may actually be different from uh, different types of uh, information that's actually circulated for um, other people. So the, the environment can actually lead to different policy uh, possibilities. So I, I think uh, the question is actually quite interesting and I do hope that that actually answers somewhat. Um, I would actually pass it to somebody else. Okay. Thanks for Alina. Uh, Fitri, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Gilan. Thank you for the question. Um, um, I think one of the way that I can propose in how to create a system that can help women is uh, perhaps um, having a collaborative effort uh, or um, a movement that uh, is collective, not only uh, depending on the government, but also uh, civil society, academics, um, um, activists, and uh, also uh, uh, local leaders to actually create um, uh, education, uh, public education and awareness in terms of how to uh, uh, use a digital platform, how to um, to actually be um, polite perhaps in um, uh, online, how to perhaps access the technology in a way that is safe. So uh, I guess, I mean, government have done a lot, but I don't know, for example, how many people visit the, the, the website of Ministry of Information, for example, to actually learn how to to learn uh, to use this digital access. Uh, I, I don't, I got um, this uh, um, text in, 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 in groups sharing that in, uh, Indonesia Ministry of Foreign, uh, sorry, Indonesia Ministry of Information and Communication is uh, uh, providing training, for example, collaborating with Google and other um, uh, uh, digital platform to, uh, to give education on how uh, uh, people can use uh, uh, digital tools, like how they can be entrepreneur, how they can um, uh, be um, influencer, for example. But then uh, because of the population is so massive, uh, I think it would be, um, would be difficult for the, for example, the 250 million people to all depend on the, 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 the government. So I think um, having a digital collective movement um, of the civil society, um, the media as well and uh, private to to actually like, collaborate uh, and uh, to, uh, to to actually stop uh, the the uh, online gender based violence and to educate how to be wiser and smarter uh, online. Thanks, Fitri. Um, Ambassador Kelly, would you like to chip in your two cents on uh, issue of online gender based violence? Sure, I think unfortunately, the issue of increased gender based violence, both virtually, uh, you know, and, and in person, uh, has increased all over the world. It's not only specific to Indonesia or to Southeast Asia, it, it's an issue in Canada and all around the world as well. And it's such a, a multi faceted uh, challenge as people are stuck at home, you're seeing, you know, increased rates of, of abuse against women, abuse against children, abuse against uh, LGBTQI members and, and other marginalized groups uh, for a number of, of reasons. And I think, you know, the, f the first step in terms of a, a solution is, is realizing one, that the problem is there and it's being exacerbated in progress that has been made in these areas in terms of uh, societal uh, views of these issues um, uh, and some of the resource constraints that exist are, are real and, and the situation is deteriorating. I think there's also a need to recognize that you know, those issues are not going to stop when the pandemic is under control and there are going to be some very long lasting negative impacts um, 
with regard to these trends. Uh, and third, that there's going to be a need for uh, resources uh, in these areas, whether it's in terms of education, whether it's in terms of mental health resources or a stronger legislation uh, and law enforcement. Um, and I think, you know, the, you know, as always, there's, there's two sides in terms of contributing to the part the problem, uh, the platform, as well as contributing to the solution. And I think that digital tools can be created for awareness raising, uh, so that there's better understanding that this issue and these challenges exist but also in terms of identifying resources that are available, whether it's um, mental health uh, tools or access to hotlines or to medical and mental health practitioners or easy access to, to law enforcement and social services. Uh, and then I think you also have to be able you know, to have a, a willingness to uh, to look at taking measures against um, online sites that are implicated in in perpetuating this violence and, and abuse against these groups. So whether it be uh, you know pornography sites that are posting videos of uh, women that have been abused and, and holding them accountable, and you, you would be following the the conversations about putting pressure on credit card companies, for example, to no longer use their uh, their services in support of those kind of sites. So I think, yes, the, the problem has absolutely been exacerbated under the pandemic, that once the pandemic is under control, it's going to continue to be a problem, uh, and that the platform itself, uh, you know, we'll have to deal with the underlying issues and how it's contributing, but also making it part of the solution in terms of awareness raising and delivery of, of services uh, in new ways. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Kelly. Uh, we have one more question here from Alif Satria, uh, who has asked that um, several studies, uh, so I think this is uh, directed to all panelists. So his question is, several studies have shown um, that digital platforms, for example, Telegram, WhatsApp, Twitter, have facilitated online radicalization, more so among women who are not as restricted in their mobility online as they are offline. Uh, how do you think governments can and or should incorporate gendered frameworks in order to counter, to counter these radicalization dynamics online? Uh, okay, I think I'll start with, uh, I don't think there are any other questions that I have here. So uh, I'll start with uh, Fitri, maybe to answer. Thank you, Gilan. Um, it is uh, it is interesting how uh, the access of technology uh, as part of empowerment, and it was said that uh, in the era of um, uh, Islamic State before in, er, in mid 2010, 2014, uh, onward when we have ICs, uh, we see how women also uh, using digital platform to uh, as a voice of um, that because they were uh, usually uh, women in traditional Islamic community are not allowed to uh, uh, be out and about, especially without mahram, uh, they would uh, have uh, they would find that the digital platform is useful uh, to to convey uh, their message. And and uh, of course, uh, I remember their research um, in uh, 2015 that, that see how digital platform has a way of empowerment uh, and, and as a way of recruitment uh, and, and women are not, uh, uh, as well as men, um, joining uh, the recruitment for the Islamic State at the time. Uh, but um, I think it is important to to actually do uh, deeper re research, and if uh, I'm not mistaken, uh, Alif Satria, he uh, is a graduate of uh, Georgetown University that uh, uh, actually focusing. Um, at least his lecture is fo focusing on how uh, uh, women uh, actually uh, be involved in in. Um, 
uh, in uh, this uh, group of uh, radicalization, first and foremost. I think uh, uh, I know there are a lot of message uh, that has um, been uh, put out through uh, digital platform, but, uh, but, but government, uh, I think, should also, and I think have been being uh, quite creative in doing counter uh, narrative on how, how, um, how radicalization uh, or counter radicalization can be done. Uh, for example, the Indonesia uh, National uh, Counterterrorism Agency uh, has been uh, uh, also uh, c conducting um, uh, education to women to, as the, the peace um, uh, activists to, to say that uh, women can be uh, the education of the home and then to prevent uh, their children to uh, to uh, be attracted uh, online. So I, I, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Farlina also uh, did um, uh, her earlier work uh, also uh, deal with the women radicalization. But um, Farlina messaged me that I, he got, she got power issues. So I, I don't know whether she's uh, connected with us. So thank you. I think that's from me, Yuan. Oh, <laughs> sorry. I was, uh, I forgot to again. Sorry, I was just mentioning, would you like to provide your answer to uh, Ali's question? Uh, sure. I apologize very much for for the for that in, uh, random interruption. So I think some interesting um, studies when it comes to how uh, the different genders actually do end up using uh, cyberspace that can actually perhaps add to some of the discussions uh, when we are actually looking how uh, how dynamics work online and how it actually feature in radicalization because I think uh, there's actually a healthy amount of and there, there has been research done on how women actually do get radicalized and I believe um, um, Dr. or Ms. Navat Norania I think she's actually one of the featured um, uh, I think uh, the experts I think in this area and she, she's actually like uh, written work about how uh, how the community is, is actually a building a sense of community and how this actually works uh, with online radicalization. Um, I think something that would be uh, interesting when we are actually looking at online offline dynamics and actually how to solve this problem would feature in uh, it would concern the the uh, raising digital awareness among women, uh, building tolerance to even certain types of uh, misinformation or disinformation or actually being utilized in, um, in this type of spread. Because sometimes the, uh, the spread of information would actually, it, it would actually uh, concern different factors. And I think uh, addressing these types of areas in addition to actually all the areas that uh, Fitri actually mentioned would be quite useful, particularly when it comes to uh, addressing some of the offline online dynamics to radicalization. Um, I do hope that actually helps. Thanks, Farlina. Um, Ambassador Kelly, would you like to chip in on uh, Ali Satya's question? I think the, the key arguments have already been highlighted uh, in terms of the, the countering radicalization and the gender component uh, or the need to apply a gender lens in, in terms of better examining that issue. But I think, you know, as I stated earlier in my remarks, uh, applying a generous lens is an important part of the Canadian foreign policy and Canadian international assistance policy. Uh, and that's because we believe that there, you know, it's relevant to apply a gender lens in all issues because fundamentally women and men uh, do have different approaches and there are uh, different, you know, there's better understanding that can be gained. There's a more valuable and rich conversation to be had in terms of identifying solutions uh, and it's more inclusive. So yes, absolutely for this and, and all other issues, I think there is value in applying a gender lens. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Uh, just another question 
Another question here from Dandi Rafi Trandi. Uh, he asked, uh, some studies reveal uh, that women that have a higher risk of job displacement due to automation, um, I think that's what Farlina mentioned. Um, any comment on this? Um, any any panelists would like to chip in on this uh, question from Dandi Rafi Trandi? Uh, I can go to, maybe I can start with Ambassador Kelly again. Uh, we'll, we'll take another reverse order with this instance, please. Sure, I think, I, you know, this issue is, is fairly well documented. Uh, and the fact that women are, are quite active uh, and um, represent the majority in the informal sectors uh, and in terms of uh, low-skilled jobs uh, and um, manufacturing in certain sectors. And therefore, as we move to automation, um, that those individuals are going to be the ones that are at risk uh, as automation proceeds and, and other advancements in technology are, are seen uh, in terms of, you know, goals of industry 4.0 and modernization. Uh, and so it's important to recognize that risk and uh, that exists, uh, not only to women, but others in, in impacted industries, uh, and to be proactive about uh, providing solutions. And so whether that is retraining programs, or, um, you know, going even deeper and recalibrating and, and redesigning how education is implemented and the, and the focus of, of education so that all segments of the population will be able to benefit from the changes and ultimately have higher skill levels and, and better paying jobs uh, so that they do have opportunities moving forward uh, and better advancements. Uh, easier said than done, uh, I know, but um, you know the, the earlier that we can identify that changes are needed and find a way to effectively deliver uh, those, those changes on a widespread and systematic manner, then, um, then we're going to actually see some positive change across the board. But yes, absolutely, women and other uh, lower skilled individuals are at greatest risk. Thank you, Ambassador Kelly. Uh, Fitri, you'd like to answer Dandi's question? I think that can be the fear. As we can see how COVID actually, the COVID impacted and how we're going digital and the, the uh, service industry that was a majority, there's, I think, um, higher proportion of workers are female and uh, that is in the services and like the shopkeepers and so tourism uh, impacted. And, and I think um, uh, maybe the question perhaps directly in the automation, uh, um, in the, the mechanic industry of, of like uh, factory production. But I guess this is a um, looming uh, concern. We we have all these consulting companies and research organization, institute and, and university actually um, raise the question, what's the job for the future and how we can prepare better our future generation to, um, to actually be equipped on that. Um, uh, I think I think I uh, I second uh, Ambassador Kelly in terms of how we we can can uh, help um, uh, those uh, not only women but uh, majority of women that works in a high intensive labor um, uh, to actually. Uh, upskill themselves uh, and, and perhaps because the trend is going digital to, to re-educate themselves uh, in all uh, age and stage of their life uh, because that's always the challenge, right? So so how would you would, uh, as, a, as, a, as countries, as, as our um, original organization, see this, um, this trend going forward? Uh, I guess, uh, I guess um, to answer the question, question the risk is yeah women has that risk uh, as well as other uh, high uh, intensive uh, um, labor manual work uh, as well and ASEAN uh, government needs to um, pay uh, attention on this uh, thank you Agilan. thank you Fitri uh, Farlina which I know you talked about automation before and how it, uh, especially in women in gig economy would you like to elaborate more on 
on this topic as uh, as uh, asked by Dandi in the question? Uh, I think actually a majority of it was actually addressed, particularly the interlinkages when it comes to uh, education and um, the the gender gap. I think when it comes to women, uh, women participation uh, as labor, the low skilled labor, the structure of the women labor force, also um, women actually participating in terms of like a, a, as a part of the economy in a more MSME kind of uh, environments, which we have actually already seen in COVID that it may not be uh, as resilient. Um, I think one, one quote that I actually find very interesting when it comes to automation, um, because we actually do have to understand automation actually do bring its, its own opportunities is that um, the men stand to gain, gain one job for every three jobs lost to technological advances, while women are expected to gain one job for every five or more jobs lost. I think this actually explains that this uh, articulates the, the disparity when it comes to um, STEM education, when it comes to um, the type of gender discrimination that can actually occur when um, women would participate in uh, industries, uh, the different uh, the different types of responsibilities that would actually be borne by women, uh, particularly when it comes to professional and domestic work. So some of these things would actually structure um, some of the would shape the approaches when it comes to how would nations leverage the best of the automation while uh, actually allowing equal participation or greater participation from women. Um, so uh, just echoing a lot of the thoughts raised earlier. Okay. Thank you so much, Ralina. Um, since we run out of questions, uh, and I don't think we're going to wait for more questions to trickle down, if I may, uh, I'd like to present a question for me to all the panelists. And if we still haven't had any question by the time I've, I'm done, uh, I think the answer to my question can be wrapped up together with final thoughts and comments from all the panelists and the experts here. Uh, and then we close down the discussion for today. Uh, I hope that sounds good for everyone. Um, my question, uh, I'd like, I try to put this in a very simple and also succinct form, is that we talked about a lot of um, private sector, we talked about the economy, we talked about, you know, there was a question uh, addressed on online gender-based violence um, that are met in, um, in a dating world, for example, you know, I, I, in my mind, think about, must have met Tinder or in uh, Coffee Meet Bagel and et cetera. Um, and so we see this intersection, right, where people are using private um, uh, services, uh, social media, we talked about this a lot. And, and Fitri, she talked about having a higher accountability by, by I couldn't hear you. Online social media platforms go close. I couldn't hear you. Would you mind to repeat the question? Uh, Is it better I, now, Fitri? Yes, Is very much. Now? I was going to repeat your question. Uh, so what I'm getting is... Uh, no, no, it's okay. I, I, think I, okay. I think I can just continue from here. Yeah, Thank you. so I was talking about... I was talking about um, your comment before on how an increase in account, accountability by online social media platforms need to be held more accountable in how they deal with hate speech, right? And my, my question is, I'm, I'm trying to find whether there, are, there is a nexus or whether there has been uh, opportunities and um, actions that are being held between the private sector and the uh, government in trying to mitigate any forms of um, challenges that are created, cyberbullying, for example, uh, upon women, or maybe in a gender neutral form, uh, because we see that uh, private company social media platforms are engaging in uh, a lot of public services. Um, for example, like Facebook, when they announce that uh, they, 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 they have a safe, safe uh, what do they call that? If, you, if you're trapped in a natural disaster, you can, you can claim that you are safe in not being uh, impacted by the disaster. So whether these sort of um, initiatives have been taken forward between the government and, and private sector in dealing with cyberbullying um, in the cyber sector, 
towards women or maybe in, even in gender neutral. So that's that's my question. Um, everyone can feel free and, uh, to answer and also to uh, to wrap it up with their final statement as well. I'll start with Ambassador Kelly, please. Thank you. In some, yes, I think that uh, private corporations do have a role to play in terms of developing internal policies uh, and accepting uh, responsibility for activity, uh, illegal activity that takes place on their platforms. Um, but if, you know, it's a very delicate balance in terms of respecting freedom of expression, freedom of, of interaction, but there are definitely lines uh, that can be crossed. So yes, uh, the corporations that run the platforms, the companies that run the platforms definitely do have responsibility in my view. Um, and then just in terms of, of final thoughts, I think, you know, we, I, I think it's very clear and all of the, the presentations have highlighted the fact that as as technology advances, as the number of tools and, and platforms available in the digital space increase, that that presents a number of opportunities, uh, but also a number of challenges and education and comprehensive policy and relevant legislation is going to be important and to try to keep up with the pace uh, of progress to mitigate the negative consequences uh, that the the new technologies and, and platforms introduce. Uh, and in my view, the other point that has been highlighted in this conversation is the the relevance and the value in applying a, a gender lens to this uh, and other issues for the sake of having inclusive conversations, uh, enriched conversations, but also for creating uh, inclusive and effective uh, solutions to these very complicated challenges. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Kelly, for the comment, final comment uh, and the answer. Petri, would you like to answer and provide your final comments as well? Uh, thank you, Gilang, for your question. I was, um, uh, for, from your question, what I found was like Tinder, coffee made bagel, but then, <laughs> no, <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I, I got your point. Um, how, how, uh, how can we have um, an approach that is, um, it is uh, between uh, government and uh, the private sector uh, to have the nexus and cooperation in, in a way that is um, effective and 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 and, uh, and solutive to mitigate challenge in the cyberspace to women and. Um, I think there is already an effort uh, already in terms of co uh, collaborate co collaboration between uh, government um, and uh, government and um, the on uh, the private online platform. However, uh, of course, um, um, mostly it is uh, when the cases are big and uh, very visible. Uh, I think if we, if we see uh, individual reports in terms of women uh, being um, uh, assaulted uh, online or, or uh, facing um, uh, uh, online um, harassment, that sometimes uh, it was more difficult of course that can be done by uh for example uh banning certain word being used or um or having the the ability to report uh but i think we need to encourage uh the uh, the cooperation between private and the government in terms of uh, protecting the individual uh safety um, freedom the on, on the online space um however we need to actually be mindful that not uh because of because of the the, the nature of um private companies uh, uh on online platform they don't have they're online right they're they're not 
non uh, uh, transboundary and sometimes government does not have the ability to um, uh, ensure uh, or like um, impose their regulation uh, on a company that is not on site not within their sovereignty and this is something that each government have to grasp and especially this uh if we talk about the context in asean how strong is other um, not all the 10 countries of asean has this ability to able to pressure the um the uh, online platform or, or internet platform to 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 push on uh what the demand is um uh to 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 for example counter uh hatred speech and so on and then uh and then of course they uh, government need to be sensitive as well to threat uh whether this is actually uh countering misinformation disinformation and uh um uh, mitigating the the uh the uh violent in the cyberspace uh or uh because uh we see the trend as well that the government is easy to be pointed that they are not undemocratic and they're limiting the freedom of expression. So this is a final line. And I think um, we need to be um, uh, sensitive, wise, and, and have the wisdom, you know, as the N word, have the wisdom uh, in, in how to tread uh, this. And I, I think uh, it is also beneficial for government to to uh, also collaborate with the civil society to, to have this uh, mechanism um, uh, uh, on collaboration, um, because uh, the limiting uh, uh, ability of the government. Uh, sorry for being taking too long. So for my uh, uh, closing uh, statement is, I think I miss uh, something that is also important. When I see Ambassador Kelly here, I I, I miss in my presentation to address how important is it it is to have a female policymaker that is knowledgeable on the cybersecurity no, uh, issues and how it is impacting um, the population, including women and uh, minorities, um, as uh, Ambassador mentioned before and I think we need to have uh, the perspective of the policymaker that is uh, also in the line of the uh, this gender sensitive and also make sure that the voice of women and the minorities is included and being uh, protected in um, in the face of evolving uh, technology I think that's for me thank you Gilang thank you very much Fitri uh, last but not least Farlina you have the final say uh Thank you very much. Uh, I think I probably, uh, I wouldn't have great insights, I think, in regards to, uh, say, the private sector as well as the private sector roles. And I believe that there are actually conversations when it comes to private sector participation when in creating safer cyberspaces. I think the question would be, um, what would be achievable in the short term, the medium term, and even the long term? Um, long term would definitely be building the types of relationships and uh, maybe platforms, even um, conversation, uh, dialogue platforms between either the government and the private sector, the government and the um, the government, private sector, and civil society, which can actually allow for greater facilitation of policies. Um, I think in shorter, um, so the conversation actually has to start somewhere. In very short terms, um, some of the gaps when it comes to, uh, say, cyber, how do you address cyberbullying? How do you address um? Uh, online gender-based violence would be in regards to awareness building where uh, if the private sector chooses to actually play a greater role to actually facilitate how do you create um, how do how could people actually use the online space in a safer manner then that would actually um, dis redistribute some of the resources that would actually be heavy on the government and that can actually be quite useful for there to be greater efficiency when it comes to um, implementing some policies and also creating some of a better um, safer and safer cyberspace. Um, I think in terms of, because I feel like there is uh, sometimes and when it comes to policy questions, how can uh, how can private sector say uh, introduce ideas or how can there be greater um, conversations on, on, on how can there be better uh, creation of a uh, safer cyberspace? Like uh, some of the, some, because some suggestions can actually range from um, say, uh, should people actually register with their uh, with their names on like forums or in places, and then then if uh, if offense is actually done, it would actually be a report or it would actually be some a record that sticks. But then you actually remove the ability for people to um for people to actually voice out their opinions, particularly if uh if it would concern things like um. 
uh, if if there if there actually is spaces where it's difficult for them to actually freely express themselves. So uh, some of the regulations and partnerships actually do have to consider, and it may be a longer road than just actually having simple solutions. Um, but the dialogue is actually definitely an immediate step forward. Awareness is actually something that can uh, that can see fruits of uh, labor, uh, perhaps in a in a quicker manner. Um, so last, uh, so my key takeaway, I think, from this whole session would actually be uh, in regards to the necessity of gender mainstreaming, I think, and gender mainstreaming of these topics. And then also to um, understand the differences and nuances of how uh, some of these issues actually do impact the different genders in, in specific ways, because these are nuances that can be light. Um, for instance, cyberbullying and actually how it actually impacts women, how it actually how it perpetrates it within uh, women to women, women to men, uh, how how men actually do uh, receive the types of bullying and cyberbullying, and how did actually even um, gets reperpetrated. So um, these type of things actually are the core of uh, developing ways forward, and actually trying to understand it would require. Um, research, I think, but it's also the intensive type of research where you actually do have to conduct surveys and understand psychological understand, uh, build psychological understandings and things like that. So, um, I think that it's a it, it's a very it, it's a very important step to actually take forward. And I actually do appreciate this opportunity and this learning space. So, thank you very much. And thank you very much, Fralina. Uh, I think that we, we finished just right on time. I, I, I understand this is 11.29. And uh, I, this has been a very thought-provoking discussion, very uh, enlightening as well. And I've been very, it's, it's been an utmost delight for me to be the moderator for today's uh, discussion. And I thank all the speakers today, uh, Ambassador Kelly, Dr. Fitriani, and Fralina to provide their insights upon um, the cyberspace and also how challenges face by women, especially within the Southeast Asian region. Uh, now I'm putting my proverbial moderator foot down, uh, no more questions as well. And um, I thank you again for participating, all, all of the participants uh, throughout the event. And I, I hope that we can meet each other again. I hope there's more discussions and also uh, cooperation to come between CSIS and um, Canada Mission to ASEAN, hopefully in the future. Uh, and I think uh, for this, I'd like to close today's seminar. Thank you very much. And I won't and have a good lunch. <laughs> I think uh, it's, it's more past lunchtime in Kuala Lumpur right now and in Australia. So thank you very much and hope to see you again soon. Goodbye. <laughs>